Welcome to Manufacturing Talk Radio. Welcome everyone to this episode of Manufacturing Talk Radio. Today, David Mante is joining us from IEN. If you're not familiar with that, it is Industrial Equipment News. He is the editorial director of about a dozen digital and print properties. So David, you're a busy guy. Thanks for taking the time to join us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on today. So you have 180,000 listeners, subscribers, uh, newsletter people, and like that? We have 180,000 subscribers to our magazine. IEN is our flagship magazine that kind of blankets the manufacturing industry. But overall, our total reach is uh, more than a million uh, subscribers and readers every month. Wow. Great number. That's a great uh, number. You, you are the 800-pound gorilla today. <laughs> you know what? It's it's summer, but I'm still carrying a lot of that COVID weight, man. <laughs> so, David, you and Lou had a conversation a while back, and then you decided to join us on the show. Tell us a little about IEN. I'm fascinated. So, Industrial Equipment News actually goes way back. It was originally launched by, um, do you remember the old uh, Thomas Registry, the big green oh, books? Yeah. So they originally launched IEN um, uh, 1927, I think, something like that, nearly 100 years old. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a big, it's a tablet magazine. It was a, uh, a new product book. And uh, it was, it's kind of been the industry standard ever since. It's kind of had um, ups and downs over the years. Re uh, industrial media, we took over the property about seven years ago through a partnership with Thomas um, and kind of revitalized it. Um, not only revitalized the print product, um, which goes out six times a year, but we revitalized the website, um, we offered some daily newsletters, other digital properties, and we've since grown the portfolio with a number of other manufacturing brands, some that you might know like manufacturing.net, uh, some that are, are a little bit more niche like food manufacturing, industrial maintenance and plant operations and uh, industrial distribution. Wow, that's quite a quite a bill there. And a million a million views a month. Yeah. It, when, what I like to say is that, so we have our publications from Design and Development Today, which is the design engineering, OEM design engineer readership, all the way through industrial distribution. So we kind of cover every aspect of design engineering and manufacturing and kind of throughout the whole chain. So there's only 12 million only, only 12 million people in manufacturing, specifically directed at manufacturing, and you've got a million that are listening and reading and watching what you put out. 11 and, million more to go. Okay, there's, <laughs> there's the target. There's mm -hmm. the target. Okay. So David, so, Lou and I have been doing this for almost a decade, and mm -hmm. we have heard all kinds of numbers about the dire straits that manufacturers will find themselves in because they can't find skilled labor. And, and right. I, I could go off on a dozen tangents, but let's talk about that problem. Is it real and is it coming? Oh, it's definitely real and it's already here and it's been here for a while. Um, one thing, one thing that always surprises me with that number is how long we've known about it. We've known about this impending job shortage and we've sort of almost treated it like climate change right where it's just like we'll sort it out we'll sort it out somehow we're gonna you know we'll innovate our way out of this and um you know while we have worked on uh automating and uh you know using tools like uh collaborative robots or cobots to augment manufacturing workers and kind of bridge the gap so to speak i mean we still are in kind of dire straits when it comes to what are we going to do in the immediate future until we find a real long-term solution. And, um, you know, it's a real mixed bag in terms of things that manufacturers can do to retain and find new employees um, and things that people can do, like communities can do to kind of raise people that are more, um, you know, 
more likely to find a, a profession or desire a profession in engineering and manufacturing. We have a show that I like to uh, I like to bring up called Gen Z in Manufacturing. It's a, a new podcast. We've only had a couple of episodes so far, but it's you know a lot of times we just hear platitudes, right? We hear old manufacturers saying Gen Z doesn't want to work, and we have Gen Z saying we just want to work smarter. So it's like you know what? Let's just talk to them and see what they want. And it's crazy how once you get Gen Z manufacturing workers on the plant fo floor, kind of a how their minds are blown in terms of what manufacturing has to offer. And the thing that kind of blew my mind is that they, even though we think we're doing a great job of promoting the manufacturing and engineering industries as a great job now that's clean, innovative, and tech forward, how so many people still don't even know about it as a career path. That all has to do with the fact that parents, and I'm going to beat this drum until I punch a hole in the drum, parents were, and to a lesser degree now, they wanted their little Johnny to get a college degree. Yeah. They didn't look at the $200,000 debt that the kid's going to carry for his whole life, uh, unless the Democratic Party manages to get tuition forgiveness uh, the way they want it. Uh, but the point is that the parents need to understand that when when a kid goes into the into manufacturing, it goes into manufacturing, the kid's going to make more money than he could have with a degree. Agreed. And that's a legacy. That's a legacy issue. I mean, it wasn't just little Johnny. It was little David, too. Like my dad um, was an engineer in manufacturing. And I have memories of, you know, him leaving before I woke up and him coming to, coming home uh, filthy at 7 p.m. just in time for dinner. And we'd wait. We'd hold dinner late just so we could have dinner as a family, you know, and as a result, that's like a generational shift that has kind of stuck with me. I mean, granted, I'm like the black sheep of the family. Everyone else in my family is in engineering and manufacturing. I just write about it. So I'm the one that's made fun of. Um, but I think I think that that's a it's, it's a real issue. And again, it's not just on the parents, I think, as a manufacturing industry. When we're looking, when we're in our manufacturing industry echo chamber, we think we're doing a great job, right? There's first robotics, there's Lego Mindstorms. We have kids building robots out of Legos. We have competitions um, at all the trade shows. And we really think that we are making a dent in this labor shortage, but we're not. And uh, because we're so close to it, I, I think that's where we kind of fall down a little bit. Whereas um, when you talk about these students, who are in college right now, in, in college at the professional level and at uh, community colleges, stuff like that, uh, they don't know that their skills translate to a successful career in manufacturing. And I think that's where the downfall is. Well, that, I, I agree with everything you just said, but there's one other aspect. And that is that if we had a immigration policy that would aid our issues here in this country, the problem could be solved overnight. I, we, I agree with you. We should be stealing people from other countries. <laughs> I mean, Ukraine, I mean, they have millions of people that are talented, creative, hardworking, industrious people. Get them over here. But the politicians say, we're going to lose jobs. Mm -hmm. The unions are going to say, we're going to lose jobs. And that's, it is a, that's, not, that's not true. It is remarkable how heavily politicized the immigration issue has become. And because it's become sort of a political tool, there, is no, there are no real solutions being presented as to how immigration could solve a lot of our labor, sh labor shortage problems and how have they have a lot like immigration reform has a long legacy of solving labor shortage problems. Um, and I completely agree with you where there's a lot of, uh, I mean, ever since I was a child, I can remember people, the immigration argument being, you know, these are people that are taking jobs nobody wants, right? So I don't understand the conflict when a job is filled by no one, you know, that nobody else wants. And if we have millions of manufacturing jobs that aren't getting filled, I mean, there's a real labor pool there that could 
that could really uh, do some help for a lot of manufacturers out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it's something that would actually be, I think, easy to implement. I don't think we have to worry about us bringing in terrorists. I think that particularly coming out of the European market and uh, out of the South American market, we can easily vet the people coming into this country instead of putting up barriers across the Rio Grande so that people are dying as they're crossing. I mean, that's absurd. Well, and if there is a clearer path, then we won't wind up with a lot of these incidents where we see primarily at food manufacturing or food processing facilities and other um, other facilities where they are using undocumented workers. They are using workers that have uh, false papers. They're using underage workers because of bad documentation. If there is a clearer path to reform in terms of using immigration labor, I think it winds up making a safer industry as well. I think that I, I agree with that. I, I think that what we need is to have two parties who agree to work together, which isn't going to happen. Yeah, that's just bananas. And that's it. <laughs> just... I think you're just asking for too much, Lou. You're asking for common sense. And unfortunately, common sense is over politicized right now. <laughs> Maybe we need a third party called the common sense party. <laughs> I've heard it work in the past. All right. Well, we don't talk politics. Sorry, Tim. Yeah, I was going to say, I got to get you off of your soapbox here. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I, I just remember the days when I went to, at that, now they call it middle school. It was junior high school for me. And they had shop class. And they taught kids to work with their hands and mm -hmm. take a good deal of pride in what they could create. And I carry that forward to this day. They need to bring shop back in school. And no, I completely agreed. And there has been, again, because we're so close to it, there has been a small contingent of people, manufacturers, tool makers uh, that are working to create tool shops in schools, um, donating equipments, giving the resources. A lot of times it's finding a teacher that can actually run that class because there's a teacher shortage as well. Um, but I completely agree with you. The biggest thing for me um, is having that sense of worth that you are creating something that is truly helping millions of people around you. So when I was in college, right, um, I worked in a manufacturing facility and uh, I started out at a sorting table, right? It was a silicone injection, uh, injection molder. I was a sorter and I was sorting these little circles made out of silicone that are called domes, right? And it was monotonous. It was tedious because what I had to do is I had to pick up 5,000 of these domes like every two hours or whatever and look at this little ring to make sure it was intact. Didn't know what it did. Didn't care. Hated it. And as a result, like grew this distaste for the profession. But then someone told me what they were. And these domes went into soap dispensers everywhere in the world. So that way they created the suction that pulled the soap out of the bag so everyone could wash their hands. And just that little bit of information gave me a greater sense of like self-worth as to what I was doing because I really understood the impact of my job. Same with some of the other products that they made there. I... Once I understood what they were, some of them went to uh, dentistry that were used for tool sanitation. Um, you know, these are things that otherwise look like worthless or meaningless. And then once you realize what kind of impact they make on the industry, you know, it really helps. It really helps every individual worker. And I think that's something that we've gotten away from where, uh, you know, there was a great sense of pride of being a manufacturing worker and helping build a better America. And uh, we've really gotten away from that in terms of now people think they just, you know, they just make bottles or they just make cans. And uh, I think there has to be a greater, for lack of a better term, uh, storytelling in terms of how we're all uh, building a kind of a greater good as an industry. I would agree. I would agree. Uh, David, your organization studies and writes about lots of trends in technology in manufacturing. Lou and I are always fascinated by what manufacturers are doing and what they can do. What are some of the latest trends going on? I mean, uh, I'm always a sucker for additive manufacturing. I'm a sucker for 3D printing technology just because 
that is a true revolution that we're still at the ground level of. I mean, um, the biggest issue with um, additive manufacturing and 3D printing now is that we have uh, design engineers who don't know how to design for additive manufacturing, kind of using it at a rudimentary level. Once we have new engineers or once they kind of skill up and it's, it's not that it's not that bad. Like, I mean, once they skill up and once we have sort of a new generation that has been born now and lived through additive manufacturing, once we're, we have those people designing for additive manufacturing, I think we're going to see some truly revolutionary parts come off of these presses because we're talking about things that are otherwise unmanufacturable. And so there's something that engineers never even considered, right? Because what's the whole, I mean, you're designing for manufacturability, right? Once that is no longer in the equation, it kind of opens up a complete world of possibilities. So I am uh, constantly inspired by the new materials that are coming out for additive manufacturing. I mean, they're, I mean, they're printing glass, they're printing ceramics. Uh, it's just incredible stuff. And uh, it's going to be another, I don't know, 10 to 20 years in terms of what we see, what, what a completely additive manufacturing engine looks like, you know, uh, I think it's going to be, it's going to be revolutionary. Um, I'm also kind of, uh, inspired by what we see in robotics, the, how the industrial robots have come to bridge the gap with not only the worker shortage, but the skills shortage where some of these robots in order to train it, the person literally just has to take the robot and touch the three things it's supposed to do. And that's programming the robot. Um, we've seen it come leaps and bounds in terms of where the technology was and where it is today and how usable it is by every manufacturer, small and large. Uh, where, what, what's your thoughts on uh, AI, uh, which is, you know, the hot topic? The hot topic. I mean, my thoughts on AI is that if unchecked, we will realize a dystopian science fiction future and we will all regret it as a result. But that's completely outside of, uh, you know, what humans will do, right? We have a long track record of doing everything the right way. So I'm sure it's going to be fine. Um, uh, right now, I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of manufacturers using AI on the service side, the customer service side, um, you know, bots on their websites. I've seen AI used successfully for compliance and creating compliance documents. Um, but I do think there is, oh, and um, what was it, Toyota? Uh, Toyota's design firm is just trained an AI tool that was pretty incredible because until now, designers, you know how like AI can create images, right? So right. these designers were going in and they were putting in a few prompts like, hey, what's a new car? Um, a new car design concept that's kind of sleek, more aerodynamic, and just putting in general prompts to see what images came out. Well, uh, the Toyota Institute, they trained an AI tool where it can accept their initial design sketches, and then they can give it design prompts to really fine tune it, which could cut out hundreds of iterations. Um, that's powerful in terms of how AI could revolutionize uh, product design um, and manufacturing as a result. But I mean, right now, overall, AI is a buzzword that everyone wants a piece of, everyone wants to add it to their website, talk about how they're using AI, and uh, really they're just using it to write emails to their sales staff. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh, David, I want to share something with you. A couple of years ago, I got my young son a 3D printer. Oh, great. And he really got into it. I just mm -hmm. want to share with you how much he got into it. Whoa. That is a uh... later. This is the Mandalorian helmet. Yeah. <laughs> that is 3D printed. 3D printed on a 3D printer. <laughs> That's amazing. So yeah. he does this stuff at home and, and kids watch or listening to this show, young adults can do the same thing. Incredible stuff. It is it is incredible. And uh there are a lot of um I guess 
3D printing influencers, uh, DIYer influencers on YouTube, TikTok, where they are showing people how easy it is to use 3D printing to kind of create their own things. And some of it's really niche. You know, some people are making custom action figures. Some people are customizing other toys or making movie props, such as the one that you have. But that is really getting people interested in the true capability of the technology. And, uh, you know, um, kind of it's just going to take a handful of them to move the industry forward. Because, I mean, I see a talent like that. Thinking, I mean, that is a solid Mandalorian helmet. I mean, he's got some real talent. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to push him into manufacturing. <laughs> you may have to interview your son. How do he make it? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, that's the kind of, uh, I always look at it like this, David. Find something around you other than air that wasn't manufactured, what you're sitting on, what you're sitting at, what we're using for technology, the microphone in front of you or me. Everything around you was manufactured. We just mm -hmm. take it so much for granted. I, You know, I completely agree. When I started, when I started in this industry, I started writing for a publication called Product Design and Development Magazine, and it was the design engineering uh, vertical in the space. And what blew my mind was I found out that I could ask that question about everything, and everything was a story. So um, everything from a Boeing Dreamliner to the microphone in front of me, or even the cables it's connected to, everything has a story in terms of how that was. It went from a napkin sketch to a realized product on the market. And I love telling that story. And I think that people love hearing that story. We've seen not just articles written, but there are series, television series, like dedicated to how things are made. And uh, I think it's truly fascinating. And I think if you can continue to tell that story and show that sense of worth to workers rather than just you know, rather than just pushing a button on a CNC machine um, and letting them know like, hey, no, you're not just pushing a button on a CNC machine. You are making an engine that goes into a John Deere tractor, which is used in a field to create food for the entire food chain, uh, food supply chain. I mean, that worker that, you know, was just a button pusher before really, you know, maybe they think they do a little bit more and uh, a little bit more sense of worth combined by maybe a little bit, a few more modern HR practices uh, could go a long way in terms of re uh, retaining and keeping workers happy. Yeah, I would agree. It does make a difference when you understand what it is you're working on. It's the human equation. We always ask, and my three-year-old granddaughter is now doing it, why? <laughs> yeah. want to know why mm -hmm. the um, and legitimate question and so another trend that i've seen and i'm interested to get your point of view on this is uh the gamification of the workplace so um and it is it's kind of like uber right where every time you take an uber you uh rate it and they all are they all on five stars it's like you rate everything now five stars or it's just a worthless rating but I've been talking to people on the HR side of the manufacturing industry, and uh, they're talking about the gamification of the interview pro or the review process. So basically, younger workers, what they see is that they kind of want to know where they stand on a more regular basis. So they're talking about doing reviews every month. How do you guys feel about that in terms of, you know, for me, it was always that yearly review. And you kind of, I don't know, I've been lucky in terms of the places I've worked where the re yearly review is just like, would you prefer to do this in a bar? Cause I'd prefer to do it in a bar. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, workers want to know where they stand and sometimes a year is too long for them to go. And so they talk about every month having, uh, programmatically you would use us use software. Um, you would rate the worker, let them know what they're good at, where they need improvement on a monthly basis. And that's supposed to really help with uh, job retention in terms of helping a worker know where they stand and their uh, potential trajectory going forward. What do you guys think about that? Well, you just added another level of management involvement uh, in a process that takes a fair amount of time. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree that one year is a long time. 
Uh, so what I do with our staff is that I'm constantly telling them, you know, how great they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and periodically, every couple, three, four months, uh, we do a luncheon and take every the whole company. We go out to lunch. So all of those things mean something also that forgetting about on the individual level, but as a team and mm -hmm. no company works well unless there's a team. And I, I like the idea of, of praising the team in addition yeah. to sales who do extra work in terms of creating revenue for the company and so on. But that's sort of where I stand on that. Monthly reviews, I don't know. It's almost that's like you have to hire more people to do the reviews. Well, I think that a monthly review is for maybe a company that doesn't do that type of outreach, because I think a lot of that communication is lost for manufacturers where some managers don't understand the importance of just saying like, good job today. Or having that constant communication with people saying like, you know, uh, you're valued here and you're doing a great job. Right. Um, and so I think for manufacturers that don't necessarily have a good job, uh, have a, a manager that's good at that, maybe it could be a potential asset then. I don't know. The interesting, one of the things that Lou and I have discovered, even, even between he and I, because I'm in Atlanta and he's in New Jersey, is that one of the worst forms of communication is email. <laughs> it has its one way street. It sucks. And <laughs> there it is. I put it out there. It's and, out there. It can be misinterpreted. It has no emotion unless you put little emojis in it. Uh, and it's easy to make a statement that the reading party considers as an attack when you meant it in jet. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Tone is tone is hard with uh with an email tone is really hard with an email and uh so i can't imagine you guys uh like slack any better or any of those other tools that are used to uh send texts <laughs> no those yeah. innovations i think were interesting at the time i'm not sure they're helpful now so when it comes to a monthly review or even a quarterly review david i would say if it's in person and i don't get an email saying good job tim uh yeah that well, has powerful value so we're also talking about when we're talking about gamifying this and Lou, to your point about it being too time, time, uh, too costly from a time perspective is that very much like Uber, this is just, would be an app, right? Where kind of at the end of every ship, every, every shift, just like five stars for whoever, four stars for whoever, three stars for whoever. And then, um, right now it would be a monthly report in terms of, I mean, it reminds me of first grade, right? Like uh, in first grade, <laughs> my teacher would give like every student a star if they had a good day. And then there was a one day David didn't get a star because maybe he had a problem talking back. Uh, but like now, then I think the next step is like daily where people are going to get a daily sort of rating on their phone. And it'll just be like, hey, I had a five star day today. What's up? <laughs> I can definitely. I'm going to leave that alone, David. I'm going to leave What's that, that alone. I don't. I don't have time to give stars to every employee. <laughs> <laughs> Monthly is bad enough. Daily. I I know. I know. It's just. It's. Uh, but it's one of those things where I would have never thought of that as a potential tool that could help. You know, uh, that might be wanted by anybody, let alone an entire generation of workers. So I don't know. That's why when I hear stuff like that, I'm like is that is that what it's gonna take my goodness so many feelings no. yeah it's some wild stuff david I, I wish we had an hour and a half to chat with you which is another way of saying we want to have you back on the show uh, oh but we're quickly running out of time and we greatly appreciate you being with us no, I, uh, you know, I love your show. I'm very happy that I got an invite to be on it. I would love to be on the show another time. Um, it, thank you very much for having me. It was, uh, it was my honor. This is great. We'll, we're going to talk uh, offline further. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'd love to have you back and uh, we'll see what else we can come up with. Hey, that sounds great. I'm looking forward to it. I want to thank everyone who tunes in and views our show, listens to our show, subscribe to us on YouTube and in about uh, three weeks, I'm going to meet up with David in lovely Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, we'll talk some more. Appreciate him being here. I appreciate IEM giving him the time to join us, and thanks, everyone, for watching.
Thank you very much. We'll see you in Madison. That's our show for today. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please like and subscribe, share on social media, or leave a review. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Rumble, or your favorite podcast app. Visit us online at mfgtalkradio.com for our other episodes. We have also included links to our advertisers below. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week.